Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are faithful, that you are with us, that you guide us, that you have a plan for us, a hope and a future. And I pray that as we go through this message today, that Jesus Christ will be uplifted, that he will be seen, and that we can draw close to him, that we'll have a communion that we have not yet had. Thank you again for your amazing love and your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. This time, I'm going to uh, share my screen once again, so you can follow along in uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I have for today's message. Again, I hope that you have been able to uh, download the study guide that's going to go along with today's message, Enux Outpost. And we live in a, a very unique time in Earth's history, and I was uh, definitely reminded of that last evening as we were having our 40 days of prayer. And during our 40 days of prayer, we were shaken up a little bit. Hmm. We had an earthquake and many of you texted us last night and said, are you okay? And it was kind of humorous when this happened. If you can see, it was uh, 6.53 p.m. last night. And the location was, well, it felt like it was right underneath us. But it was 11 miles from uh, Anza, which is where uh, we live. And it was right at the time where I was mentioning that I really felt like Satan was trying to destroy us. We had just read John chapter 10, where it says that Satan is like a, a thief who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It was definitely a reminder of his uh, annoying power and his uh, desire to destroy us. Now, there's two groups of people when Jesus comes. We want to look at these. One is the lost. They're, they're going to be the people who are destroyed by the brightness of Jesus coming. And they're the group that is going to say, fall on us and hide us. They have not developed a relationship with God. They don't know Jesus and his great power and the plan of salvation. But there's also a second group. And the second group is the one that's depicted in Isaiah 59 and verse 2 that says, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. I hope that we are all going to be in that second group. Is that your desire, my friend? Do you want to be in the second group when Jesus comes saying, This is our God. I want to be there. The Bible describes some characteristics of this group in Isaiah, uh, I'm sorry, in 1 John chapter 3 verse two and three, it says, beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. There are several verses that we're going to look at that have a key word, and the word is pure or purify. I want for you to keep that in mind as we go through today's lesson, Enoch's outpost. God, God's people, when Jesus comes again, will be a pure people, and there is a part for us to play in this experience, but we're going to see exactly what that is as we continue. In Psalm chapter 24, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? Notice what it says. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So the hands and the mind. Keep that in your remembrance as we ponder another scripture. It goes on to say, in verse 4, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. At the end of time, there is going to be a group of people that are described in Revelation chapter 14 as those who follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. I want to be part of that group, don't you? Mm. 
Let's look at verse five as it continues to describe these people who are going to be translated, those who are going to see Jesus come without tasting death. It says, Revelation 14, verse five, and in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Let me ask you a question. Does that verse talk about you right now? Can you say that in your mouth is no deceit and that you are without fault before the throne of God? I think if we are all thoughtful and prayerful that there needs to be a deeper experience. At least that's what I felt when I look at this verse and I ponder the people that God is looking for in Christ's object lessons. It says he is waiting with longing expectation for his character to be reproduced in his people, and then Jesus will come. When I look at this verse, I say God has to do something, and he has. He's given us an example, actually two examples, of people who have been translated to heaven without seeing death. Let's ponder these two examples. One is Elijah and the other is Enoch. Maybe at another time we can study more the life history and the lessons that we can glean from Elijah. But today we're gonna to focus on Enoch. Notice what Ellen White writes in Review and Herald, March 3, 1874. Enoch and Elijah are the correct representatives of what the race might be through faith. What's the key word, everyone? Faith in Jesus Christ, if they, cho if they choose to be, if they chose to be. Satan was greatly disturbed because these noble holy men stood untainted amid the moral pollution surrounding them. Perfected, righteous characters. I want you to, I hope you have that study guide and you're writing that down. They perfected righteous characters. Of course, the whole key is that it was through faith. Their righteousness was a righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. And they are an example to us. It goes on to say, they were accounted worthy for translation to heaven. I want to be accounted worthy for translation, don't you? As they had stood forth in moral power and in noble uprightness, overcoming Satan's temptations, he could not bring them under the dominion of death. Praise the Lord. I want to be among those who do not die, but see Jesus come in the clouds of glory. And we can learn these lessons. We don't know exactly what's going to transpire. God does. Some of us will die, some of us will be alive, but I long to be part of that group that is going to see Jesus when he comes in the clouds of glory. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. This was our scripture text for today. In verse 5, it says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Notice a few key points in this text. Number one, we've already alluded to. Well, actually, we said very clearly, it is by faith. It's a righteousness by faith that Enoch had. It was a deep experience. And then the second thing to notice is that he had a testimony. Do you have a testimony? Do I have a testimony? Our testimony is so powerful, and God wants us to share what Jesus has done for us. If ever there was a time to arise and shine, it is now. Uh, as we have studied the past few weeks with uh, Pastor John's uh, tremendous sermons, they show us that the world is anxious, afraid, and perplexed. The scenes around us are clearly foretelling what the Bible has said is going to happen. We see even before our very eyes, the prophecies of Revelation chapter 13, we see a great affinity toward the first beast of Revelation 13. We see the power that the Roman Catholic Church is currently uh, using and 
saying that they have a solution for the crisis, we have a testimony to share with the world and the world needs to hear it. The world needs your testimony. Whatever Jesus has done for you, don't hide it. Now is the time to shine brightly for Jesus Christ. But I want for you also to see that Enoch understood that he was pleasing God. He understood that he was pleasing God. That means he must have taken some reflection. There must have been time in his life that he contemplated and he talked with God as a friend and understood that what he was doing, where he was living and how he was conducting his life was pleasing to God. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Again, verse 6, Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, we read the words that are recorded for us. When Jesus comes, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The trials that we are facing right now are uh, relatively small in comparison to the great trouble that is going to shake the world to the core. Every earthly support will be cut off. We've seen just a little bit of some of the conveniences in our lives being cut off and what a challenge that is. But every support will be cut off. How is it possible that we are going to make it through a time like that? It is only possible through faith. That's the only way we can please God. That's the only way. And it's those who diligently seek Christ that are going to develop this kind of faith. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 8, page 331, paragraph 3, Ellen White says, to such communion, God is calling us. To that communion that Enoch had, whatever it was, that's what we need. As was Enoch's, must be their holiness of character, who shall be redeemed from among men at the Lord's second coming. Enoch is an example for us of of a person who did not succumb to death, but was alive when Jesus came. We need to learn to live the life of Enoch. In Genesis chapter 5, it tells us, verse 21 to 24, Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. After he begat Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. I want for us to just pause right there before we continue and underscore the term walked. Now, uh, there's a lot that we could unpack in that, but the walk simply means the way he lived. Enoch lived in agreement with God, but there's also another uh, health principle that is here. Enoch walked with God. Do you go for walks in your experience? Do you talk with God when you go out on your walks? There is a great blessing. We're told that walking is the best exercise. And if ever there was a time when we needed that, it is now. And to know that we can walk and talk with Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, what a blessing it is. It says, so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. Where did God take him? Well, it's very clear uh, from our reading of other portions of scripture, we understand that God took him to heaven. And there is a cute little story that uh, I gleaned as I was preparing this message. Much of the content came from one of Elder W.D. Frazee's sermons, actually called the Enoch's Outpost. And there's a reason for that title. Uh, It's directly for us today. But notice, a little boy was uh, relating the story of Enoch and said, Enoch and God used to walk together. Sometimes they would take long walks. One day they got so far away from Enoch's home that God said to Enoch, it's closer to where I live. Come on home with me. Isn't that a cute story? But it illustrates the point of the communion that Enoch had developed with his heavenly father. 
Enoch understood God not as just a impersonal force, but Enoch understood that God was a personal being who wanted to know all about his heartaches and his experiences. Let's look deeply into the life of Enoch together. Going back to Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, we find out uh, about Enoch's life. Not a lot is said there in the scriptures, and I'm so appreciative for the spirit of prophecy. It says, Enoch's walk with God was not in a trance or a vision, but in all the duties of his daily life. Enoch was not someone who was totally oblivious to the world around him. As I remember, there was a, a, a verse, uh, actually, it was a quote that Pastor John mentioned a couple of weeks ago in the sermon about COVID-19 and the mark of the beast. And it was talking about John the Baptist, taken from the book Desire of Ages. It said that John was a keen observer of the things that were happening around him. And it tells where he observed that from, which we'll get to in a, in a moment. But what I want for us to see is that Enoch understood what it was to live in the world. He was not one who was a hermit, as we see in this next statement. He did not become a hermit, shutting himself entirely from the world. For he had in the world a work to do for God. So Enoch was a wonderful person to be around. You can imagine, it says, in the family and in his intercourse with men, as a husband and a father, a friend and a citizen, he was the steadfast, unwavering servant of God. Very interesting term, the servant of God. Do you recognize that you are a servant of the Most High, that God has sent you, my friend, on a mission to the world of his goodness and his love? That is what we must understand. Now, what did Enoch do other than his daily occupation? In Jude chapter 1, because there's only one of them, verse 14 and 15, we read about Enoch. And he was a Seventh-day Adventist. Notice what it says. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also. So he was a prophet, a preacher actually, is what he was. He said, behold, the Lord comes. So he was an Adventist. He believed the Lord was coming with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on all. Does that not sound like the message of the Adventist church that we are to proclaim to the whole world? Revelation chapter 14 tells us the hour of his judgment has come. This is our message, and it was Enoch's as well to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Did Enoch live in a nice environment? I mean, was the uh, world around him at just a great time of peace and were many people following God? Notice this verse. How many times does it use the word ungodly? Enoch lived in a very, very corrupt society just before the flood. We know that uh, this Enoch's history is right there in Genesis chapter 5, before the flood. Ministry of Healing tells us something that should strike home with each of us. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. Enoch was a missionary, and so are you, and so am I. We are called to be missionaries. No sooner does he or she come to know the Savior than they desire to make others acquainted with him. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his or her heart. Praise God. Here in this verse or in this uh, text from Ministry of Healing, it shows us are we truly born again? Are we a disciple of Christ? If we are, we will be a missionary. Seventh-day Adventist, it says in Testimonies, Volume 7, page 138, have been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. 
like Enoch was. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the world and brought them unto, into connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to them to be given to the world. And now is an opportunity that unlike any other, please pray earnestly for the efforts that are being put forth uh, from different uh, entities of the church, different organizations that are trying to call people to Jesus Christ. How did Enoch uh, have this experience? How did he attain his perfection of character? How did he attain such a righteous life? Well, our text alluded to the fact that he was walking with God. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, the Bible clearly says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? There has to be an agreement between the human and the divine. That is the key in the whole mystery of godliness. Our part is to agree with God, to connect with God, and then as it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that he is going to complete the work that he has begun in us. What a blessing it is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, we find the key principle that Enoch understood. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch that which is unclean, and I will receive you. Remember our earlier text in Psalm chapter 24? Pure, pure heart and clean hands. Clean hands. Very important. Enoch understood what this meant. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, we find the clear passage that many of us have memorized. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Enoch developed a hatred for sin. It does not come naturally, does it? Each of us struggle. We each have our own uh, special thing that we enjoy. It could be uh, in the realm of food. It could be in entertainment. It could be in a whole number of things. Satan knows how to tempt us. But Enoch was able to make his connection with God so firm that when Satan came, came with his temptations, there was nothing that was attractive to him. He said, I'm not even interested. That is what the time that we spend with God can do. Now, I want for you to look very carefully at this next statement in light of what is happening in our world today. In the midst of a life of active labor, Enoch steadfastly maintained his communion with God. Okay, so we already understand that Enoch was not a hermit. He didn't just disappear up into the hills wherever he was and never come down. He was very active in labor, but he maintained his communion with God, just like Jesus did. Never was there anyone who had more responsibility than Jesus Christ himself, and yet he was always connected with heaven. I want for you to notice, as it goes on to say, the greater and more pressing his labors, the more constant and earnest were his prayers. He continued to exclude himself at certain periods from all society. What was he doing? He was self-isolating, a term that many of us are very familiar with in our current situation. I hope that we're taking the opportunity that God is giving to us at this time, it is an opportunity for us to develop a closer walk with God than we have ever had before. What an opportunity. So I know there's a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties going on in our world, but let's take it as that opportunity to let Jesus become everything to us. This is from Gospel Workers, page 52, paragraph 1. As many of you know, I like statistics quite a bit. And uh, I was very curious to come across the 
member survey that was recently reported at the annual council meeting. Some of you are familiar with the strategic plan of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Every five years, the church makes a new vision for the next five years. From 2015 to 2020, it was called Reaching the World. And uh, it was a tremendous initiative that was taken on uh, from the World Church. But uh, I want to share with you some of the statistics that came back from it that show us that as a whole, we have a long way to go to be living the life of Enoch. Notice, Bible reading, only 48%. Now, I want you to know, this was not just a small sample. Uh, it was actually quite large. Um, 60,000 people, I think, were involved in this particular sample that they took. So it was a much bigger sample size than we've ever done as a church. But we found out that there was only 48% of Seventh-day Adventists who were reading the Bible daily or more than once a day. How often do we eat? Many of us, two, three, some more times per day. How much do we need the Bible? The Bible is God's precious book that he's given to us to understand what's happening in these last days. Personal devotions, only 52% were doing it every day. The Sabbath school lesson, 36%, uh, and prayer, 65% doing it every day. Friends, with numbers like this, uh, there is growth to be had amongst us. We look at the writings of Ellen White. How many of those in our church read the writings of Ellen White? Only 17% on a daily basis, 19% uh, once a week. We see that there's a large number who've never read 21% and some who read less than once a month. Very solemn to me as I think of the light that God has given to his people in the gift of Ellen White and how many of, of our church members, may it not be us, but how many are not enjoying this precious gift. Family worship. I believe that this is one that constitutes a huge problem in our society. This is not just Adventist, but this is uh, a, a problem in Christianity in general. There are many who are not having family worship. How can we have strong families without keeping God as the center of our lives? So I hope and pray that each of us, especially during this time, uh, you know, as I ask people why they don't have family worship. Many people say, well, it's impossible because we're working so much, we're so busy. And during this time that we've been given as an opportunity to develop our character more, many of us have more time. I understand that there are some who are working extra, but the majority of people that I come across, uh, you know, they're kind of stuck with their family. So what a better time to know Jesus. This was troubling to me. As I looked at some of these things, um, there's a large number of Seventh-day Adventists who don't understand the sanctuary doctrine. Only 56% uh, said that the sanctuary doctrine is vital to Adventist theology. 31% uh, said that they agree, mostly because it's taught by the church, but they don't really understand it and embrace it. If ever there's a time for us to understand the sanctuary and the investigative judgment, it is now. This one was really the one that caught my attention the most. Jesus' second coming is very near or in our lifetime. We see that 34% said, yes, I am confident that Jesus will return in my lifetime. 22% agreed. 35% said, I am not sure. I hope and pray that we can see the world around us. If you are convicted today that you need to revive your prayer life, I want to invite you to join the 100 Days of Prayer. Just go to revivalandreformation.org and you'll be able to sign up. I believe that God 
understood this crisis far before any of us did. And he understood that we needed 100 days of prayer. It was originally scheduled to coincide with the general conference, which has been postponed until next year. But we still need 100 days of prayer. The messages that have been coming in my inbox every day have been very encouraging. And I hope and pray that you will avail yourself and that we can have small groups that join together uh, more and more uh, to participate in the 100 days of prayer. Now let's talk about where Enoch lived. Did he live down in the cities of the plain? We know that Sodom and Gomorrah were known as the cities on the plain. We understand that before the flood, there was definitely people who were crowded into cities. But where did Enoch live? And what lessons can we as Seventh-day Adventists learn from where Enoch chose to live? Did he live in the bustling metropolis or did he live in the mountains? By the way, this is a beautiful uh, mountain picture from the mountains uh, up around Turkey. Uh, very, very beautiful environment for sure. Let's find out. I want to encourage you, if you have, don't have uh, your plans yet for this afternoon, to read this particular manuscript, manuscript 42 uh, from 1900. It says, Enoch walked with God, though living in a time no more favorable to perfection of Christian character than the time in which we live he did not make his abode with the wicked. Notice very, very carefully. He did not locate in Sodom thinking to save Sodom. He placed himself and his family where the atmosphere would be as pure as possible. Enoch did not make his home in the city. Enoch made his home in the countryside. And we're going to see exactly how he did evangelism because Enoch was a preacher. And if any of you know someone who is a preacher, they just cannot keep silent. Uh, they, they can't be isolated. They have to be witnessing for God. So how is it possible? Enoch lived in the mountain, and yet he was a powerful preacher of righteousness in his day to prepare the world for the flood that was soon to come and also to uh, broaden people's minds to the second coming of Jesus Christ, as was mentioned in Jude, verse 14 and 15. Patriarchs and Prophets, which is the book that we're studying for prayer meeting, I really want to encourage you, if you're not already participating in a midweek prayer group, we want to invite you to join us at Mentone. Just let us know that you're interested in joining our meeting. We have lots of space in this world that we live in now. The sky's the limit. So on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific time, you can join us from around the world. Join our prayer meeting as we meditate on patriarchs and prophets together. It talks about Enoch there. It says, distressed by the increasing wickedness of the ungodly and fearing that their infidelity might lessen his reverence for God, Enoch avoided constant association with them and spent much time in solitude, giving himself to meditation and prayer. Do we believe in Christian meditation? Yes, we do. The meditation like Enoch, focusing on God and his character, not emptying our mind, but focused on the mission and the person of Jesus Christ. This is the experience that Enoch had. He understood that by beholding, we become changed. And as we uh, are all very familiar with, the cities of our world are a hotbed of vices. There is so much temptation that is there for us to avoid that. It would behoove us. It would be very good for us to follow the example uh, of Enoch and uh, be careful of our association with the ungodly. This uh, is a picture that I took this morning uh, here in our beautiful, peaceful valley up here. Uh, it was so nice 
just to be able to understand that the world is in great turmoil. There's a lot of challenges. And as many of you, I'm sure you get the updates and uh, you know about uh, coronavirus and um, you know that the cities are really what people are watching. The, uh, there are these hot spots that are developing all over the place. And we've seen what happened in New York and predictions for uh, upcoming cities to be overwhelmed by the number of cases. But here, as I was on my walk this morning, I was just thanking God for the beauty of nature. Sabbath is a day that we should spend time in nature. But Enoch had a, an understanding that he would place his home in the nature. He would not just go to the nature, he would live in the nature, and then he would work in the city. Enoch was not one who uh, was going to forget about the multitudes in the plain. In that article that I encourage you to read, it goes on to say this. It says, at times he went forth to the inhabitants of the world with his God-given message. After proclaiming his message, he always took back with him to his place of retirement some who had received the warning. In other words, Enoch understood something about discipleship. He understood that it's not just a casual, let me give you a tract and I'm done with my job. Enoch understood that evangelism is very personal. And so he would take people back to his own home and he would invite them in to sit at his table and to witness to them and to really help them and to be a blessing. Some who had received the warning message, he took them back. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, this is the great gospel commission that is given not just to the pastors and the missionaries, but it is given to all Christians throughout the ages. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I would like to introduce a tool that our Seventh-day Adventist Church has developed to help us to make disciples. It is called the Discipleship Handbook, uh, something that you can get at the local Adventist Book Center or even on Amazon, uh, on the Kindle. You can, you can get it, a uh, very amazing resource to help you become a disciple maker. If there was ever a time where we need to take this seriously, it is now. It is now. And the Discipleship Handbook can help us. It's a time where we need to be aggressive missionaries. As one of my friends was uh, sharing on a webinar, he was uh, quoting the text from Luke chapter 21, where it talks about the end of the world and how many people's hearts are failing them for fear. And then it says in the text, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. And he brought out the point that fear does something to us physiologically. When people are afraid, they kind of tense their muscles and contract inwardly. That's the fear posture. Many people are afraid in our world today. I hope and pray it's not you. I hope and pray that uh, your anchor is in Jesus Christ and you understand the time in which we live is a time for us to arise and shine. If we lift up our eyes, we've changed our posture. It's not one of fear and cowardice. It's one of openness and aggressive service for the master. In Acts of the Apostles, it says, in the trust given to the first disciples, believers in every age have shared. Everyone who has received the gospel has been given sacred truth to impart to the world. God's faithful people have always been aggressive missionaries. Not just aggressive, aggressive missionaries, consecrating their resources to the honor of his name and wisely using their talents in his service. 
May God help us to be aggressive because according to those statistics that I read, we're not doing well uh, in general. Only a very small percentage of people were daily involved in helping or often rather, sorry, just often. There was a large portion of those uh, who filled out their survey and said, I don't help with ministry during the week and that can never be. Met community needs, again, not a lot of people involved. Praise the Lord that there was a higher number who were trying to help uh, give Bible studies or help others with religion. But Enoch's experience tells us that a true Christian experience is one of selfless service to others. And I guarantee you that when we take more time to pray, God is going to impress us. God will impress you. God will impress me on who to call on who to reach out to, on who to help in some way during this time. Many people are very open. The next one, attended an evangelistic meeting. Very little, very few people attended an evangelistic meeting in the last year. We have an opportunity to change that. At Mentone, as you know, we are starting our evangelistic series. We've been planning it for months and it is going to go forward on Friday, April 10. Pastor Jeff Harper is going to be preaching at 7 p.m. And we encourage you to go to revelationofpeace.live. Go to revelationofpeace.live and I want you to register. Not only that, I would like to invite you to register on behalf of someone else. You might have a friend who you think would enjoy this, register for them and make it easier. And they will get uh, the information on how they can tune in. We're still working on exactly the best way to reach the most people. But this is something practical that all of us can do at this time. And uh, our social media team is putting out the information on Facebook and other networks so that people can understand that we have the Prince of Peace who wants to be on our side. As we end our message today, I want for us to look at some very clear practical lessons that we really need to be very thoughtful about as a people. Review and Herald, September 27 in 1906, it says, wise plans are to be laid in order that work may be done to the best possible advantage more and more as wickedness increases in the great cities. And as many of you know, there are, uh, there's an increased tension of what is going to happen if there's a major uh, shortage of supplies and the looting and violence that can happen. We have to work them, those great cities, from outpost centers. This is the way Enoch labored in the days before the flood when wickedness was rife in every populous community and when violence was in the land. In evangelism, a question is posed. The cities are to be worked from outposts, said the messenger of God. Shall not the cities be warned? Ah, yes, the answer comes. Not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. Outpost centers, outposts is what is needed. Enoch had an outpost. What about the cities? Are we to neglect them? Should there be nothing there? No, it's very clear in the, this testimony, special testimonies, series B, number eight. It says repeatedly, the Lord has instructed us that we are to work the cities from outpost centers. In these cities, we are to have houses of worship as memorials for God, but institutions for the publication of our literature, for the healing of the sick, and for the training of workers are to be established where? Outside the cities. Especially is it important that our youth be shielded from the temptations of city life. Again, evangelism as God's commandment, keeping 
people, we must leave the cities. As did Enoch, we must work in the cities, but not dwell in them. Evangelism, page 77, paragraph 5. Going on, Evangelism 78 talks about the difference between Lot and Enoch. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom, because remember, Lot thought that he was a missionary in Sodom. All that he did and his family could have been done by them, even if they had lived in a place some distance away from the city. Enoch walked with God, and yet he did not live in the midst of any city polluted with every kind of violence and wickedness, as did Lot in Sodom. May we learn the mess. The uh, may we learn what Jesus is saying to us again from the book Evangelism. You know, before I read it, let's just remember that Enoch's message was not accepted by all. Actually, there were very few. Uh, we read uh, as we go through patriarchs and prophets, we found out that there were some who accepted the message that Enoch bore and they died before the flood. But remember, there was only eight people uh, that escaped from the flood. The truth must be spoken, whether men will hear or whether men will forbear. The cities are filled with temptation. We should plan our work in such a way as to keep our young people as far as possible from this contamination. We're almost done. A couple more. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into the rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. If you're interested, if this message has specifically struck a chord in your heart, I hope it has on several, several um, different layers of our life. But if you're really convicted, if this message has come home to you and you definitely say, I want to do this, I want to get out of the city, if you realize that it's God's call for you, I encourage you to take a look at some of the resources that have recently been put out. Doug Batchelor, as you know, uh, president of Amazing Facts, has a country home. He does uh, work in the cities, but he also understands country living. Uh, so you can take his book there at Amazing Facts. Another one that has been a personal benefit to me is by Jerry Franklin. And his is more of the homesteading style of things, but I want to underscore the message of Enoch is one of close connection with Jesus Christ. The message that we have been given for this time is to take the three angels' messages to the world. There are people who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And my earnest prayer is that we might develop that communion with Jesus Christ as never before. We're living in such a serious time. God is calling for each of us into a deeper experience, one in which we see Jesus, that we reflect his love and we share in the message of love and mercy to the world.